What's up? What's up? What's up? Welcome to another episode of the Electric Podcast. Today, our guests are Tim and Tracy McLaughlin from Fister, all the way from North Carolina to Smoky, Hazy, Utah. So, were you guys bummed when you landed and it was just, yeah. a, just a smoke fest here? They were hiding the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> we come all the way over. We don't have mountains where we are. That's all right. We have ocean. Yeah, our country's. Uh, of burn, burning to the ground <laughs> from, my, from, my, from my home state of, ca- of California. Yeah, thanks, Tim. <laughs> I, br- I brought it with me, apparently. <laughs> well, I was talking to uh, uh, Mario on um, on Friday, and apparently you weren't even supposed to go outside here because it was, it was so oh, bad. Really? Yeah, so at least today we can actually go out, and air quality's not all that terrible. Thank goodness. Yeah. Should we be wearing a mask outside? <laughs> Let's not get into that. <laughs> <laughs> Man, so the 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 Shearbolt power couple. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, I think I'll start using that. <laughs> I think you're one of the few uh, married couples in the industry that that work together. I believe so. Yeah, a lot of people ask us that. How does that work? But it works out pretty good. So how did you all? How did you meet? Where did you meet? Tell me the story. We met at uh, a previous employment where we used to both work um, back in 2006. I was in charge of hosting customer events, and Tim walked in, and as you can see, he's he's a jokester. Um, so that's the long story short. <laughs> well, she came up and asked who I was, and I told her my name. Uh-huh. And she's like, oh, you're a, a customer? I'm like, no, I work here. She's like, you don't work here. I know everybody who works here, and you don't work here. <laughs> I did like, say that. I like her. She's saucy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it hasn't changed. Yeah, so we've pretty much been doing the same thing ever since. So how long did you all date before you tied the knot? Two like, years. Two years? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah, we've been together 15 years now. And we've always worked together ever since he started um, when he moved down here. So we're a good team, we feel like. So I'm assuming uh, in North Carolina, you both work out of the house. Yep. So when Tim's not traveling, you guys travel <laughs> driving each other crazy? Or do you work, t- or how often throughout the day are you actually like coercing and, and, and speaking to each other about business and whatnot? Um, pretty much throughout the day. I mean, he's the technical expert, uh-huh. so he's able to help and assist me do a lot of things. And, and it's good having your coworker right there where you can answer questions or ask questions if you need it. So it, it works for us. I know a lot of people find that hard to believe that you could work and live with your spouse all the time, but it does work for us. Tim <laughs> does travel a lot, which is probably why we're happily married. <laughs> he's not home 24-7. Um, but it, it's a good uh, – It's we're a good team. Well, you figure for me, I'm gone half the time. Yep. Most of the time. So when COVID hit and I was home all the time, that was a big test for our marriage. <laughs> I'm sure. You probably learned a lot about each other that you didn't even know before, right? <laughs> well, she's, yeah. I mean, she said some things that were hurtful to me. <laughs> she's, she started calling customers saying, don't you need him? Is there something he can help yeah, you with? Can Tim come out and like do I a do. training or like an overview? I do. When he's home too long, that's exactly what I tell him is that somebody needs him more than I do right now. <laughs> it's like that country song, though. Too much fun. What's that mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, it must be nice that like if there's a customer who's driving you crazy or is hitting you up all day. You can like go have a beer after work and like talk about it. and Or during work. Or even during work. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. What the heck? Why not? <laughs> Nowadays. <laughs> bloody, bloody marriage, anyone? It's easier to deal with customers that way. <laughs> so, tr- so Tracy, how did you get into the electrical industry? And the reason why I ask is because there's not a lot of women in the industry. So mm-hmm. I'm, always, I'm always eager and curious to learn and hear their story, how they got in. Mm-hmm. And so so tell, me, uh, tell me how you started. I started, uh, again, with my previous employer back in 1993. And you can say their name. Uh, T Connectivity. Mm-hmm. It used to be Ray Kim when I started. So did... Did TE, did they merge or did TE acquire Raychem straight up? TE acquired. TE acquired, that's what I thought, mm-hmm. okay. Um, so actually, I had a friend who worked there, and um, she was just telling me how much she enjoyed the job. And so I applied, and when I started working there, I actually worked on the manufacturing floor, second and third shift, while I was going to college during the day. And where were you going to college? I was going, I, I rotated between Wake Tech and NC State University. Okay. So I worked on the manufacturing floor, putting all the kits together, doing 
driving a forklift, working the injection mold machine. Um, and again, I was going to school during the day. Um, so I finally finished that and applied for uh, a professional job. What upstairs. did you get your degree in? I got my degree. My, my first degree was in accounting that I got. Okay. Um, so I started working in accounting. And then... Uh, a marketing position came open, and what I learned in just doing some small projects and helping them out was that that was much more in line with the things that I like to do. I like to interface with customers. I like to um, just the traveling that was part of the job. So I actually ended up going back to school mm -hmm. for my marketing degree. And then once I got that, I got a, applied for a marketing position and got that. So that's kind of how everything started was – through marketing at TE. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And then how long were you at TE before you went to Pfister? 25 years. Wow. That's incredible. My whole Congratulations. Life. Good for you. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I was a baby back then. <laughs> I hope I don't get in trouble. So, <laughs> so, so, Tim, so tell me your story. Where did you study? How did you get in the business? I want, So I think you were telling us offline that it took you 11 years to get your bachelor's? Yeah, when I um, when I finished high school, my brother had gone to college, and I went over to my parents, and I'm like, where do I go to college? They're like, we don't have any money for you to go to college. We got you a job at the utility. And you're at you're in Jersey at the time, yes. correct? Okay, North Jersey. Yep. yep. So I, my uncle was a manager at pse and and he got me a job there. I started when I was 18 as a helper in the underground, making $7.35 an hour in the wow. union. Wow. And... Um, so I was there a couple of years and it was, you know, it's a big job when you're 18, right? It's a big company. It's, it's a little daunting, but, um, you know, as I started doing it a little bit, it's a little more dangerous than I wanted it to be. And I was looking at guys who are my age now who look like they were 70, 80, wow. just beat down from the elements and working down a manhole. But you got to remember back then too, everything was paper and lead. So you know, when you were working on cables, you were working with solder and all kinds of harsh chemicals that evidently are not good for you. <laughs> but I, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> so you were at that time, you were primarily only doing paper and lead? Mm -hmm. It was all paper and lead. It was all paper and lead. Yeah, because New Jersey, I mean, all the, all the cities were, um, you know, all paper and lead. They it was, wasn't as easy to change it out because the system was small, so the new cables didn't fit in the old ducts. Mm -hmm. So it was probably an interesting job. And... Um, but I decided this isn't what I want to do the rest of my life. And I, um, I was down a manhole one day with an engineer from the general office <laughs> and um, making a specialty splice, this transition splice, where now they use heat shrink and they've been doing heat shrink for 20 years. But back then, you built everything by hand. And this guy had never been down a manhole in his life. He's reading off a print. And I was like, what do I have to do to get your job? Yep. So he told me, well, you have to go to school. And I work in the general office. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do that. And I did. 12 years later, I got that man's job. <laughs> Good for you. It's American. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, you know, it took me a long time. And I got, you know, I got to give a lot of credit to the guys I work with in the field because uh -huh. they supported me. Because sometimes I said, listen, I have an exam tonight. And they'd be like, I got your work. Go sit in the so truck. So you're doing everything. You were doing night school. Yeah. And you got, you got your degree in engineering, correct? Um, it's actually a, a business degree. Business degree. Okay. So, uh, but, you know, it was, it was interesting. The day was, you know, you went to work. It was 7 to 3.30. I drive home, eat, take a shower, go to college, 6 to 10 p.m., drive home, go to sleep, get up, repeat. Wow. So I wanted to quit so many times, but yeah. I also didn't want to work in a manhole for the rest of your life. Yeah. And some guys do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Give them a lot of credit for that's putting a, up with that's that. That's a grind. So, after, so, so how long were you at uh, uh, PSEG? Um, 22 years total. Wow. And so where'd you go after? Um, then I worked at TE. Okay connectivity with Tracy but as I got into the engineering group I went back to school got a couple of master's degrees which you so know you got your master's in engineering nope my master's is in I have an MBA and then I I'm have just going to keep on asking how many times you've gotten your engineering <laughs> degree I don't have an engineering <laughs> yeah, degree yeah. I only play one on TV yeah, exactly. <laughs> well based on your your technical knowledge I just assumed you were an engineer well that, you know I <laughs> Well, I was a standards engineer, and Mario right? Mario keeps telling me, like, Tim's an engineer. Tim's an engineer. So no, like, I just play straight one. Straight up lying. No, in fact, the second master's degree I got was in engineering management just to have something that said engineering, engineering in the it. name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. So you want, so how did you, so how do you leave a job like PSE&G and then go 
into the into like the ma- on the manufacturing side? How does that transition take place? Well, when when I got into the engineering department, it was my job to get rid of this lead cable. Okay. Right. So now I had to work with these manufacturers who made these different types of splices and terminations and things like that. So you know, there was a lot of guys around my age at the time, and you know, they just seemed like they had a lot of freedom in their jobs to you know, move around the country and do other things. So I thought that would be kind of neat. But mm-hmm. um, the engineering job was really good because I got to take what was wrong in the system and change it based on working in the manhole all the time and working in this engineering group. So yeah. I learned so much from doing that. I learned so much from the manufacturers, and I always knew one day I'd end up there. Yeah. So when they, um, you know, TE was bringing out a new product, which was right in line with Odo, what I've done my whole life, and, the, you know, they had offered me a job to move from New Jersey to North Carolina. Got it. And so was that transition hard from North Jersey, New York, living down to down to the south? Yeah, it was it was different. You it's know, I very, spent a lot of time different. in New York City and, you know, just the it's mostly the food, mm-hmm. the Italian food and, you know, the city, you know, going to plays and, you know, where I live. The allergies. Oh, my God. When I first moved to North Carolina, I thought I was going to die from the <laughs> from the oak trees. <laughs> it was terrible. Oh, wow. But where I lived in New Jersey, there were seven pro sports teams within 20 miles of my house. That's right. Right. Then I go to North Carolina and there's, was there, was Charlotte? I was going to say the, the, pan, uh, the Panthers probably weren't the even Panthers there yet. Panthers and Charlotte, but it's mostly more college teams. Right. It was all college. Stuff. Yeah. You know, so yeah, that was a different transition. You know, the food was, the food was different. You yeah. know, not being able to get a bagel. Mm-hmm. That was tight. It still hurts <laughs> me to this day. Well, I live in LA. I still can't find a decent bagel. <laughs> he has people from New York bring him bagels when they come to North Carolina. I believe it. They don't understand. It's the water. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I can buy bagels at the grocery store, but no. No. Yeah, that's not a bagel. <laughs> no. I don't know what that thing is. Yeah. What is that thing you just <laughs> throw right, There's the six of them in the bag, and fun. they're all identical. <laughs> yeah. So do you miss, like, so today, still today, do you miss the city? Not as much. Okay. Yeah. No, because when we first moved to North Carolina, it was near Raleigh. So yeah. it wasn't a city. We were in a town, but, you know, the last uh, four years we've been uh, – pretty much at the southernmost point of the Outer Banks. Yeah. So it's more coastal living. So when did you both move from Raleigh down to OBX? Four years ago. Four years ago. Mm-hmm. And you don't regret it, I'm assuming. No. Well, no. Not at all. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's like, oh, what about the hurricanes? I'm like, just duck. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> just, just pray for the best. It's still safer than working in a manhole. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> so... <laughs> two transformers blew up by my house like three weeks ago oh so gosh. just that we were out of power for 24 hours it sucked mm-hmm. yeah with the hurricane florence mm-hmm. we were out of power for a week you don't realize how much you depend on it until yeah. you don't have it yeah you don't realize how quick you run out of jameson <laughs> <laughs> Honey, is there another bottle of JMO that that actually that was, in the cupboard that I'm missing somewhere? <laughs> that actually was one of his requests. We had a neighbor who had evacuated, and we did not. So on her way back into town, she called and said, you know, we're coming back. What can we bring you? And Tim said, we need gas, we need eggs, and I need some Jameson. <laughs> and throw a little Guinness in there, too. <laughs> yeah. Some bacon. So what was the product you helped develop at TE? Um, when you first a, got hired on there. So Raycan, when I was first there, was all heat shrink. Yeah. Right? Best heat shrink manufacturer in the country. No, hands down. Yeah. Probably in the world. Yeah. And they wanted to get into the cold shrink joint market, and they had developed this all-in-one splice, which was kind of revolutionary at the time. And what? So what year is this we're talking right now? 2006. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I came in, and, you know, they, I was kind of working with them before I got the job, just some consulting stuff, like, what's it going to look like in a manhole? How will it install? Mm-hmm. You know, and people forget that, you know, just because you can install it in this room doesn't mean I can install it in a manhole. That's so, so true. So I started working with him with that. And, um, you know, that kind of got the ball rolling. But it was it was fun. You know, they people don't know what they don't know. The old saying. Right. And how many people have seen a manhole or work down in one? I um, mean, it just like to the to the general population, very, very slim mm-hmm. right? percentage, right? Yeah, so to go to work for a manufacturer as somebody who has seen that, but also been somebody who has specified these products, yeah, you know, it's probably the best of both worlds. So how long did it take to go from designs, drawings, to actually putting a splice in and installing a splice? 
Um, well, by the time I got hired, this was almost ready to go. Oh, uh, okay. Gotcha. So now, it was so you were really launching the product. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Gotcha. Very cool. So let's talk about Fister. Um, so hundredth year anniversary. Yep. This year. Wow. German. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. And we're that's, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. It is mm-hmm. awesome for yeah. a family run business, but we're yeah. upset because we should have been in, in Germany at Oktoberfest <laughs> celebrating this hundred year anniversary. What a freaking bummer. But this COVID thing. Uh, what's COVID? I don't know. I just read about it in the paper. <laughs> so... What's the what's tell me the background of Fister? It's family run business. How did it start? Who started it? Like, give me give me the give me the scoop. So we have some old pictures that we dug up, but in uh, you know in Stuttgart and hundred years ago, they started by making uh, low voltage connections. Okay, right, just not mass producing, but semi mass producing them. And it's funny you look in the pictures; all the people who manufactured them were women. Because in a lot of quality control in a lot of countries today, it's still women who do it because they have a better eye for it. So everything has to, just like at home, it has to yeah. pass through the woman first before <laughs> it gets approved, right? <laughs> I was just getting ready to say it. <laughs> right? So they, they knew that, and they, they manufactured these products, and the Fister name, you know, became synonymous with quality. Wow. And it still is today. Yeah. You know, it's gotta, I got to admit, when I first met with them about taking the job, I didn't know as much about them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously, they were a competitor, yeah. back then but on the uh you know the other side of the the gas insulated switch gear business or mm-hmm. you know i learned a lot more about them and you know like i said working for other manufacturers you did a lot of quality assessment type things and i was just amazed with the quality of the fister products that they can they control yep and what i w- the reason why i went to work there is that when i interviewed with all the people out in germany they all seemed happy to work there yeah, that's, right? you don't, that's important. You don't right. see that every at every employer. No, you don't run into no. that a lot. And um, Marcus Horn, the guy who hired me, um, he's just a great guy to work for because he knows who I am, and I don't need a lot of hand-holding. Mm-hmm. Right? And if you know that, if you work for somebody who knows your needs, then it's a great job. Yeah, yeah. So how many products... Uh, how many products total does Fister manufacture? Not like, it doesn't have to be the exact number, but roughly... Well, there's thousands. There's because th- I mean, when I think of Fister, when I thought of Fister, until we started talking with with you all, I thought of your 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 Surebolt connectors, right? And I didn't even know everything Fister had to offer. So it's pretty it's pretty incredible, right? So that catalog like you have is just what we have standardized on here in the U.S. and Canada. Uh huh. And then um, there's other other catalogs. You got to remember, it's it's a German company, so it's a European market, and you know we we're we're guided by different rules you know yeah. you have the iec market versus the ieee market yeah so i think as a german company they had a difficult time getting into the ieee market because they didn't understand what its needs were mm-hmm. so they finally got smart and hired an american and uh, in an american market so do you think the germans are going to put a, a <laughs> manufacturing facility here in the u.s or do you think they'll head in that direction eventually um you know there's been some light conversation about it i'd like to see it happen I think, uh, you know, we've shown that the business is large enough now. And very viable. Yeah. I mean, you know, you look at North America now, just for the sheer bolt sector, we're over 50% of the global market. That's incredible. (laughs) No, and that's, that's I mean, kudos to you both because you've essentially built that. you've, you've, You've built the business in America, North America. That's incredible. Yeah, it was a pretty neat opportunity that mm-hmm. we had. But, when, you know, when I started doing this, Tracy was, um, you know, she was doing all the marketing. Yeah. And um, I really needed somebody. I mean, you guys know if somebody's not taking the care of the back end of things, it's just forget about it's it. Not, right. It's just not going to work. So, uh, you know, Tracy takes care of all the all the back end of things and, uh, you know, managing the inventory and the quotes and the orders and the reports. Yeah. And every time I think of something like, hey, can I get a report on this? I get the eye roll and then I get it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You get it. <laughs> and they just grab a shot of Jameson first yeah. and I'll get it over yeah, to a you. A little JMO in me and we'll move on. When I roll my eyes, he always says, you're the worst employee. <laughs> <laughs> I still think it's so great you guys work together in the same house. Because that's uh, his wife. I'm like, you'll get it when I'm good and ready to send it to you. <laughs> when I finish doing this, I'll do it. <laughs> so, Tracy, it sounds like you wear many different hats. So how much time do you actually are able to do to – dedicate to true marketing 
Um, well, <laughs> it, it's probably 50-50. It really uh, that's, is. That's actually better than I thought you were going to say. No, yeah, I'd say it's 50-50. I beg yeah. to differ. <laughs> <laughs> Tim would say differ. I differ. Um, I, I spend a lot of time working on the uh, shear bolt. Uh, and like Tim said, we've grown that business so much, it is requiring a little bit more time. Yep. Um, but the marketing stuff is equally as important. But you know, we do have some other employees here in North America, but yet we're still such a very small team. So mm-hmm. we all wear multiple hats yep. and we all kind of look at it from the perspective that, you know, it's our company. We're such a small group here that we treat it like it's our business. It's like you're almost your own family in North America. We are. We yeah. run it like it's our business. We want to see it um, do well. And at the end of the day, that's what's important to us. They must, I mean, back in Germany, they must love that. That's your attitude and that's how you, that's how you view it. I mean, it's, it's your baby, right? Well, uh, prior to COVID, you know, it was totally different from a European perspective. Nobody worked from home. True. Right? Everybody was in the office every day and they couldn't understand how come the Americans work from home. Well, because we're scattered. This is a huge country. Mm-hmm. And we're scattered across it, so you work from home when you're not on the road. So when COVID hit, it was no change for us, except, you know, I wasn't traveling. Well-oiled machine. Like, let's just keep rolling. Right. So it's interesting, and you have to hire people who can work in that environment. You know, same with you guys. It's a dynamic company, so you need people who can work unsupervised and look at it like it's their business. And everybody who works with us has that same mentality. If you're not self-motivated, I mean, good luck. Yeah, and I think nowadays a lot of people working from home hopefully look at it the same way as it doesn't matter what time you need us, we're going to respond. We're yeah. going to answer your email or pick up the phone call, even if it's typically outside of work hours or whatever. And and again, I don't know if that's just because of our work ethic or if it's because we do treat this business like we own it. It's ours. I and think it's your work ethic. We yeah, want it yeah. to do well. That's incredible. So what's the environment like at the office in Germany right now, are they all re- are they back in the office? Are they working from home? Are they doing a hybrid? What are they doing? I think it's a hybrid. I okay. think they've started going back. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just like here. You know, it was a serious issue. And, uh, you know, but they kept the factories going, and they adjusted yeah. pretty quickly. Again, it changed every week, right, the information we got. So yeah. they did a pretty good job doing that. There was no disruption on our end at all. I mean, we got product out the whole time. That's incredible because not every manufacturer can – can say that i mean the the lead time i've so i've only i've only been in the business for uh, 12 13 years and i've never seen lead times to get material like like i've seen today Mm -hmm. it's it's uh it's pretty nuts yeah it's just like a an ecosystem right you pull one plug out of it it screws everything up so you know a lot of our material we just can't get (sighs) so that is that has changed things there's nothing more frustrating than you know you can sell something but you can't because of it you know due to lack of material or lead time or etc well, we, we were a little concerned when we started hearing about some lead times extending out or um, people were having difficulty, I think, getting like the cardboard boxes or just different things people You're were like, struggling with. boxes, come on. <laughs> like Amazon's at my house every day. Right, with use box. those boxes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we really doubled down with our inventory. Like we sent over some huge purchase orders to Germany because we didn't want customers to go through that. We didn't want that to change. So we... We really doubled, almost tripled our inventory here in North America just to make sure that didn't happen. Wow, smart. Good for you. So um, uh, so we're up against it. Very quickly, so what's the next product from Fister, other than the Shear Bolt, that's going to take America by storm? Well, I think we discussed a little bit earlier. I think MV Conics. I think people are going to realize um, its capabilities mm-hmm. and where else to use it. Because a lot of times you don't need new products. You need to reinvent the products you already have mm-hmm. into different applications. And our entire system is plug and play. Yep. And all the accessories for it. So it gives an engineer or a contractor just so much flexibility on how to run their system. Yeah. So um, I think we just need to get the word out there more. And that's what we've been doing. COVID, COVID hurt. You know, for a year plus, we weren't able to travel, yep. and we lost a lot of momentum. And now, as you're getting back into it again, the players have changed. Yeah, so let's, can, let's schedule some time. Let's get you guys back in, and let's talk about Connex. I want to learn more about it. I know our customers um, and folks in the industry want to learn more about it, so I think we should talk about it on a separate podcast for sure. Sounds good. Thanks, Tim. Thank Anytime. You. Thank you so much for being here, and I uh, can't wait to chat again soon. <laughs>